good afternoon. So, uh, firstly, I wanted to uh, thank Finn and others at uh, WIDER for organizing such a uh, wonderful meeting. And um, special thanks to those of you who are in the audience. Um, it's been a long couple days in a positive way, but uh, if like if you're like me, your minds are already kind of filled with ideas and great thoughts and uh, have learned more than your carrying capacity. So I will try to um, at least end on a good note um, and talk about a paper by my colleague Stephen Younger and, uh, and, and myself that we've been working on uh, over the past couple months. And um, the title is, a, is about as bad as the uh, terms that we use, that we made up at the very last minute uh, in the course of writing the paper, but uh, it's the incidence of recent health improvements. And um, let me begin by talking about the motivation for the paper. And let's see if I can, I'll just do it this way. Okay. Uh, so, um, Broadly speaking, I think there's a general consensus, especially in Africa, where growth has lagged or had lagged uh, quite seriously in um, the last millennia uh, or last uh, prior to uh, the past 10 years that growth has finally picked up. And that's the case, of course, in many uh, poor regions of the world. Um, but as this conference is motivated by the fact that um, still there's a great deal of concern that the fruits of this growth are not equi equitably distributed. And this has led to a kind of burgeoning literature on not just inequality per se, but issues of pro poor growth or sometimes called inclusive growth. Um, but the vast majority of that literature, uh, almost all of that literature, focuses on one fruit, as we call it, uh, income or expenditures, some money metric of well-being. And in this paper, we're going to look at, a, at something else. We want to look at a different measure of well-being, child health. And thus, the paper is kind of motivated or tries to uh, bring together two broad literatures um, that both Steve and I have worked on quite a bit over the years together. Uh, one is the literature on, um, broadly speaking, on improving living standards and poverty reduction, but uh, in the context of thinking about that in terms of the dis distribution of growth. But the other is the literature on multi-dimensional poverty. And, um, and in this case, the dimension that we'll focus on is health, although this could be done for other dimensions or be done in a multi-dimensional framework in a way that uh, Steve, Jean-Yves Duclos, and I have done in some other work. Um, so um, the purpose or the question that we are uh, trying to answer is a simple one. And it's whether and to what extent improvements in children's health uh, have been distributionally progressive or pro-poor, however you want to uh, whatever terminology you want to use. And thus we kind of address three questions um, in that regard. The first is we ask whether there are intertemporal changes or whether the intertemporal changes in health status uh, and in terms of the distribution of health status are similar or do they look like the intertemporal changes in expenditure distributions. Um, and in order to answer that question, we take two pr approaches. One is to ask the question of whether the health improvements, uh, look at health improvements across the income distribution. Basically, the analogy is kind of the gradient approach to looking at health inequalities. And the second approach that we take to looking at this question is we look at how or the extent to which health improvements are distributed across the health distribution, where instead of ordering well-being along uh, the dimension of income, we actually order well-being across the dimension of health. 
And that's kind of analogous to what's referred to as the univariate um, uh, uh, measures of health inequality. Okay. So how do we go about doing that? Well, uh, let me start off with just talking a little about the data we're going to use here. So uh, the health indicators that we're using in this data all come from the demographic health surveys. The reason that we rely on the demographic health surveys uh, is are two. The first is that they span a long period of time. We're really not interested in short spells of two or three years, primarily because, like income, there's a large stochastic element to health status. And, uh, you know, whether there's um, uh, 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 an epidemic of diarrhea, high rates of prevalence of malaria, or whatever the issue is in a community, will result in very uh, 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 small but important changes from one year to the next. So our interest is covering a long span of time. And the only data sets out there, for the most part, that are comparable and that collect health data in a rigorous fashion are the demographic and health surveys, demographic health surveys. Okay. And for many of the countries that we're talking about here, this spans a 20-year period of time or so. We have looked at shorter spells. In this paper, we're just going to present the longest spells of each country. Um, and a uh, second reason for focusing on the uh, demographic, uh, uh, well, l let me uh, say this, second reason for focusing on demographic health surveys, as I started to intimate, is that while there are other surveys that collect health data, um, the quality of that data, especially when people do things like impute infant mortality rates or look at even uh, anthropometric data in most of the LSMS type surveys, the quality of that data is, uh, is very variable, uh, to put it nicely. Um, some surveys do a really good job, but for the most part, the training and the effort to collect that data was of secondary import. And I can tell you that for sure, having spent 10 years in the LSMS unit in its early years. Uh, so the DHS data really does focus in on that. But one of the problems is the DHS data do not have expenditure data or income data. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we really don't fully solve it, but basically what we do is for every demographic health survey, we find a comparable household expenditure survey in that country for usually within a two or three year range. And simply what we do is we predict or a level of household per capita expenditures based on a, it's a projection based on a set of household characteristics that are both available on the LSMS uh, type of survey or a household consumption expenditure survey and the DHS survey. Um, so this works out pretty well. I can talk more about it at some point if people have questions about it, how we verify and, and, and look at the robustness of that. But it, it actually works out pretty well. Um, so the other thing to mention at the beginning before we start looking at results is that the inequality measures we're looking at here are for samples of kids, samples of children. They're not for households, but they're for individuals. So this has certain obvious disadvantages. It's for a select group of the population, right? Old people or... Uh, households without children are not represented here. So the upside of a course is that uh, most or all household based levels inequality measures assume that there's equal well-being within a household. And uh, so when we look at income inequality, everybody in the household is ascribed the same income and assumed to have the same level of well-being. Now, uh, Steve and I have done some earlier work, other, earlier papers. Uh, there's also been a paper by, I think, when Robbie Combor was at Wider. Um, uh, I only know of the, our paper and his paper that actually try to get at the issue of within household inequality and decompose within versus between household inequality. And we found actually that within household inequality is greater than between household inequality. So if you believe that, you kind of would be motivated to say, yeah, this is a really great idea to look at inequality at the individual level. 
So there's an upside to it, but as I say, there's a downside to it. Okay. So, uh, so much for the data. Actually, I'm going to skip this slide because of time, but just to say that, in fact, if we look at health indicators broadly over the past 20 years, they've increased quite dramatically, and in fact, more so than income. But let me go right to the methods and uh, go through this relatively quickly. So, uh, I presume that most of you, if not everybody in this room, is acquainted with kind of the Revelian and Chen um, tools that they've developed for looking at growth incidence. Okay, these growth incidence curves that they have measured. And it's basically a simple tool where they take two, you can use two cross-sectional data sets, comparable data sets, for examining whether economic growth is pro-poor or not. And basically the tool uh, or the technique uh, generates a set of curves that ask or show uh, how much income growth has taken place at various quantiles along uh, the income ordering. So these curves um, kind of look like this, and this is one that we generated using the methods I talked about where we map on the income expenditure data from the income expenditure data onto the DHS data and you can come up with these growth incidence curves, okay? And this one is actually quite typical of the ones in the paper and the ones that we find, and it's typical along two dimensions. One is that, as I said, for most countries in Africa, as well as the rest of the world now, we see that growth has increased. So this is the difference in log per capita expenditures, and this is just the percentiles of household expenditures across this axis. And then we draw this growth incidence curve following the methods of Rallion and Dot and others. We estimate standard errors around it. And we can say that, yes, household expenditures per capita have increased throughout. The expenditure uh, decile across these two decades between 1988 and 2011. Uh, but the important point here, for those of you who are interested in distribution, is the increase in growth is much greater amongst households at the upper end of the income distribution. Okay, this comes as no surprise to many of you out there, and that's not what this paper is about. Um, now, of course, some people in the audience will say, yeah, this is pro-poor growth because the poor witness growth. Okay, others of you are going to take a relative definition of pro-poor growth and say, no, this is not poor pro growth because the growth amongst the poor is slower than the growth amongst the rich. I'm not going to debate that point, uh, but the clear message here is that when we look at most growth incidence curves, not only when we do, but when others do, they generally tend to look like this, where there's more growth at the upper end of the distribution. I'll leave it to you to dis determine whether that's good, bad, or otherwise. Um, and here's some other examples from our mapping exercises using the DHS. And again, that allows us to look at these long periods that we couldn't do with just household expenditure surveys. Uh, but I'm not going to talk much more about these, so I'm just going to flip through them and get to what I want to talk about, which is what I call, first, the gradient health improvement incidence curve. And uh, there should be a G in front of that H. Uh, but this is an example of terrible nomenclature. So if somebody can come up with a better name for these curves, please let us know. Um, we're not terribly creative in that regard, at least. Um, so, uh, so what are these gradient health incidence curves, health improvement incidence curves? Okay, so basically what we're asking here is what we want to know about is the distribution of health across the income distribution. That's what these curves do, these gradient health um, uh, improvement incidence curves. And the basic question is simply whether health improvement is larger for children in income poor households or larger for ri ha richer households. And we can answer that question um, basically uh, by relying on uh, this term which is uh, either the height of children or the predicted infant mortality probabilities associated with the, uh, P, uh, with a, with a specific quanti quantile 
uh, of the income distribution. Okay, so I'm going to, um, and as I started to uh, mention, we have to do this. This requires relying on a regression, which we do non-parametrically uh, using local linear regression techniques. And one advantage of this approach actually is that it allows us to handle discrete indicators like infant mortality, which the next set of curves will not be able to do uh, because we can look at predicted probabilities using this technique. Okay, so what do these curves look like? Uh, again, I'm going to rush through this stuff in uh, deference to the time that we have allocated. But if just think about the curves that we saw, or that one example that I put up in the big screen of Uganda, where the curves kind of were going in this direction. So here's the growth incidence of infant survival uh, for Ghana. Actually, this is Uganda. Uh, I left the label off. Uh, but look at this curve. So what this curve basically says is that, uh, in this case, the probability of surviving to one's first birthday, of a child surviving to their first birthday, or in this case, being taller, which is a good measure of health, uh, is first increased across the entire distribution, right? And it increased quite dramatically. Three centimeters of standard, or two centimeters of standardized height, or one centimeter of standardized height, equals about 1.5 standard deviations of children's height at that level. That's a big increase. Now, to you, one centimeter sounds small, but at the population level, it can take countries decades to do that. Um, so in both cases, infant mortality rates decline because it's above the zero mark, and heights increased. All that's great. But the big story here is, unlike the income data we looked at, notice that the distribution of benefits is at the lower end of the income distribution. And again, we're ordering household or individuals here according to the household income distribution. So the bottom line is that the largest gains in health are concentrated at the lowest end of the income distribution. And that seems to be a general finding across uh, all, almost every country we, lo we looked at. Whoop, wrong button. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, this is the Uganda case. I guess I didn't get to label them all. Um, but the only cases that you do not see that happen um, is, and I'm sorry, some of the labels didn't come out, are countries like, uh, actually, I, um, like Cameroon, or, and I forgot which country this is, my apologies. Um, for some reason, it didn't come through. I think that's, yeah, this is, these are both Cameroon where there's been little improvement. So when there's virtually no improvement, the curves tend to be flat. But where there is any substantial improvement, the curves tend to always slope downward, increasing the improvement is concentrated at the lower end of the income distribution. Okay. So now there's one other type of curve that we can look at, and um, that is simply the health improvement incident curve. So what's the difference between the gradient health improvement incidence curve and the simple health improvement incidence curve? Well, in this case, this is analogous to the univariate approach to looking at health inequality, where the ordering along the, the x-axis is actually not in terms of income, but in terms of health status per se. Okay, so um, basically, again, we're looking at two minutes. Uh, okay. So let me just, instead of trying to clarify it, just show you the results. These results tend to be more mixed. Where we order individuals across the distribution based on their health status, we find that indeed in certain countries, for example, Peru and Bangladesh, again, the benefits are concentrated at the lower end of dis the distribution. In some other countries, however, this is a little more ambiguous. Uh, these, let me find one. Okay, Cameroon and Ghana are good examples where the benefits tend to be, um, in the case of Ghana where there were benefits, more concentrated in the upper end of the income distribution. So in the terms of the growth incidence, uh, the health improvement incidence curves where we order well-being across the height distribution, the results are, are a little bit more mixed. 
So let me go to the uh, overall results of, of the study, of what we know so far. Okay, so um, basically, the experience from our work, but mostly more important from the vast literature on this uh, in this area suggests that uh, traditional expenditure-based growth incidence curve tend to be regressive or at best distributionally neutral. Uh, and that's generally what one finds in the literature. In our case, it applied to all the countries that we've looked at except for Peru. Okay. But what we've also found is that the distribution of benefits associated with health improvements differs dramatically from income and almost is always pro-poor, meaning pro-poor in absolute terms, but also pro-poor in relative terms. And they're pro-poor in a relatively dramatic way. And the other thing is um, that the countries that, ob that observed or witnessed the most substantial health improvements, a country like Uganda or a country like Ghana, are also the countries that um, tend to have the most pro-poor improvements in their health status, okay? So it's countries like Cameroon that hardly grew in terms of its income and which hardly improved in terms of its health status that these growth, that these health incidence curves tend to be flat. But every country that witnessed a large or dramatic improvement in health also in, witnessed a very progressive change in health over the time period, okay? And then, uh, the, uh, so uh, again, just skipping to the, these health improvement incident curves, they tend, tend to be more mixed uh, than where we order well-being by income. Um, and we find that in non-African countries, particularly in the four, three or four non-African countries we've looked at, less, less healthy kids grow more. For example, Colombia and Peru were examples of that, but there are some cases, for example, Madagascar, where actually the healthier kids were growing more across the spells that we looked at. So what is the bottom line of all this? It's that we cannot predict what the gradient health improvement incidence curves look like or the health incidence curves will look like based on the traditional growth incidence curves that are use income or expenditures. So basically, the incidence of income growth and health improvements are not the same in a country. And while we are rightfully, I think, or correctly, somewhat agitated or worried about the lack of relative progressivity in terms of income growth, the good news is that when we're looking at improvements in another measure of well-being, particularly children's health, not only do we see quite large improvements uh, overall, but those improvements tend to be far more concentrated at the lower end of the income distribution scale. So thanks very much.